but also at stake are very different directions, visions of what a globalization policy ought to do. And NAFTA and WTO were one version, one model. And you can think of them as delivery mechanisms for a particular worldview. Trade's a part of it, but if you've ever heard the term neoliberalism, there's a whole package of non-trade domestic policies that have to do with things like the extraordinary investor rights and limits on property and zoning policies that has to do with service sector privatization and deregulation, commodifying services versus thinking of them as essential rights. And these, these non-trade issues, i.e. it's not about tariffs, border taxes, it's not about quotas, how much of a good you can send over a border, but it's really about your most basic domestic democratic decisions about priorities, policies within your own country, about people's day-to-day -day lives. Those non-trade rules, which by the way also cover procurement, rules and trade agreements about how you can spend your local tax dollars, and food safety, how much you can inspect, even what safety level you can enforce. Before NAFTA and WTO, the U.S. required that imports could only come in that met our laws. The Uruguay Round Implementing Act amended our meat inspection laws, allowing imports of those goods which were deemed equivalent by the exporting country. Hmm we're the importing country. We didn't get to do the deeming. And then they get a USDA label. So in the grocery store, you can't even tell. What. Now, if we kept out imports of food generally with a tariff, that's a trade issue. If we say all food has to meet our safety standards, that's not a trade issue. That's a consumer safety issue. There's no discrimination there. That's about the people who are going to eat the food deciding how safe they want it to be. So all of these rules are in these trade agreements. And the binding obligation in the trade agreements this is, the one, this is the version of it, but it's in all of them, in WTO is countries shall ensure the conformity of all domestic laws, regulations, and administrative procedures with the attached agreements. And then the WTO enforces 17 different agreements. One's really about trade, GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Half of another one, the Agreement on Agriculture, is mainly about trade. All the rest is basically non-trade domestic policy constraints that limit what not only the federal government here in Congress, but what state and local governments can do as well with our domestic policies. So at stake really is much more something like a very quiet, slow motion coup d'etat against democratic governance more than in a way a trade policy. So I brought just the Peru agreement to give people an idea of what we're talking about. This is the non-trade part. So this is, the, this is the legal tax. This is all those constraints on domestic policies. There's also a stack of tariffs and market access commitments that are five foot four. I'm five foot two. <laughs> so that, that's the trade part. And those are all like, you know, what tariff level for pink underwear versus men's underwear versus long johns. But this is the legal part. And so you kind of have to wonder, who elected these guys if this is what's going to be the constraint around our domestic laws? Now, the outcomes are scary because not only shall you conform, but if you don't, you're subject to challenges. There are the investor state challenges. That is where a corporation can avoid domestic court and privately enforce a public treaty, new innovation, privately enforce extraordinary rights as a private party in a public treaty in a United Nations or a World Bank arbitral tribunal get around the courts. The agreements also have what are called government to government enforcement, where one government can go to a trade tribunal directly established in the agreements, where three trade lawyers meet behind closed doors without the normal due process guarantees and decide if a domestic law goes beyond the limits allowed. Now, to give you a perspective, just of the U.S. laws that, that have gone down, we've seen dolphin protection laws. The flipper on the tuna fish can no longer means flipper didn't die. It just no one saw flipper die. That was a weakening required by a GATT case that then was threatened with WTO enforcement. We've seen Clean Air Act regulations and gasoline cleanliness, endangered species rules on tur nearly dis um, extinct sea turtles, and as we heard, the gambling laws all sacked, plus several tax policies, plus 31 different times U.S. anti-dumping subsidies and countervailing duly laws, among a whole list. And that's just the U.S. cases. The U.S. has lost 
90% of the WTL challenges of its laws. And you might say, wow, are we big losers? Well, no, the actual international average is 89.5%. So basically the story is if your law is challenged at WTL, the law typically goes down. A whole string of developing country laws that have to do with the sort of most fundamental rights to access to seeds, to medicines, have also been attacked. And under NAFTA with the investor to state cases, $35 million have already been paid out. So that system is not hypothetical. We're not saying, hey, this could happen. This has happened. There have been five cases decided. $35 million have been paid out. Among the cases where corporations extracted our tax dollars from governments are Mexico and Canada paying for the right to have a toxics ban, getting rid of a ad gasoline additive, a set of logging and forestry rules, land use and operating licenses for a toxic waste dump. Now, there have been big, big economic effects as well. We've now had 13 years of the NAFTA and WTO model, just one version. We went from a $100 billion trade deficit to an $800 billion trade deficit. That's 6% of our national income. That is totally unsustainable. It will correct. Either we're going to have a policy that fixes it or it's going to do it on its own, which could be highly unpleasant. Um, we've seen worker productivity almost double but we've seen U.S. real wages flat. And in fact, if you look during the entire period of fast track since, since 1974, in real terms, medium wages have gone up a nickel. Worker producti productivity has gone up 80%. So 80% in productivity versus one quarter of 1% increase in Good real jobs churned wage. out. Trade affects the composition of jobs, not the total number. So we've seen 3 million jobs in manufacturing, one out of six in the sector, churned out overseas, we've created service sector jobs, but the result is that we've seen median wages flat and we've seen income inequality increase now to a level we hadn't seen since the Robert Barron age. People might say, well, how does this actually relate to our trade agreements? They're very specific rules. For instance, those investor rules create incentives to offshore. You get better treatment if you go overseas. So if people said, why are U.S. companies going to Canada during NAFTA? That, that's counterintuitive. Their wages were higher. It's because they get out of all kinds of other responsibilities and costs under these rules. And not only that, but if you actually look at the exports that the U.S., the growth of exports, the U.S. export growth rate with its free trade agreement partners is slower than with the countries we don't have free trade agreements with. Now, what happened with all of this? Polls have showed the lived experience of this model has the public strongly against, including now up to the quintile making $120,000 a year. And in the developing world, it's even stronger because they've had a harsher and a couple more decades of experience. Creating a truly new American trade policy, what would it include? Mm, reviewing and repairing our old trade agreements that haven't worked so well, doing a trade manufacturing package to deal with currency manipulation, the deficit, the China trade crisis, prioritizing passage of the Patriot Corporations Act, which gives tax credits, benefits for creating jobs and closes the loopholes promoting offshoring, pa pass the Safe Tables Act to make sure we're not importing food that doesn't meet our standards and that has country of origin labeling, S expanding the Buy America and federal level anti-offshoring rules. So when there's work outsourced from the government, it goes to U.S. workers. I would say in the short term, the most important thing is to think about what a really good new American trade policy would be that actually gives us a new turn towards a new direction.